uh, I'm in. Hello, hello everyone. So this is Ali Azzedine from Fourth Generation for Education. And this is our special day about assessment. This is the last session. I can see some people, Sarah, they started with us at 9 a.m. in the morning. And mm -hmm. now it's approximately 6 p.m. here in Dubai, 11 p.m. in Seoul, uh, South Korea. Uh, people mm -hmm. are watching. So as you can see from Korea, from Lebanon, from China, from Saudi Arabia, uh, from Dubai, uh, Jordan, so many countries. And let mm. me check if we have some friends watching from the US or Canada, because it's the beginning of the day uh, from the other side of the of the planet. So I'm checking uh, the Facebook also to make sure that I'm following all the people on Facebook who can interact with us via the Facebook Live. Uh, in that chat here, make sure you are choosing everyone. And uh, Lujain is saying this is the sixth webinar for today. Mm -hmm. So you've done them all, Lujain. And I hope you will enjoy the uh, number six and hopefully to see you in our upcoming events. Because let me say it from now, next month, approximately in four weeks from now, Sarah, we will be talking about ATLs or 21st century skills. Fantastic. So I'm not going to take more time uh, in the introduction. People, they already know how it works. They are now familiar with our structure. So Sarah will introduce herself, share the questions of the session, uh, prepare some interaction via the chat. And remember, if you want to put any uh, question in the Q&A, feel free to send it. Sarah, it's our mm -hmm. first collaboration. I'm mm -hmm. so excited to collaborate with you. And let's say hello to Bodo, who put us in touch for uh, this uh, webinar. Hi, Bodo. Hi, Bodo. Um, I haven't said Bodo is also the person who um, who was my supervisor in my last school. It's lovely that yes. you're here. Yes. I am just going to realize that. There we are. Okay, um, so this is me. I'm Sarah Burville. I am originally from England. Um, I've taught in IB schools in Denmark and in uh, Portland, Oregon. I'm now the head teacher at a small bush school in Zambia. I started this job five weeks ago. So since I agreed with Ali to do this presentation, um, I've, I took on this new job. Um, it's a school with 12 children, um, elementary school, um, right in the bush in Zambia. So it's, it's over 40 degrees here. If I look a little bit pink, that's why. And um, outside of the window, from time to time, I'll see elephants walking past and there are monkeys hanging in the trees and baboons. And it's a very um, exciting place to live and teach. Our biggest daily challenge at the moment is the baboons have learned how to open the fridge door and we have to make sure that they don't get the children. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a very, uh, very fun place to work and has very different challenges from anything that I've been uh, teaching in before. <clears throat> um, I, Although I'm not now teaching in an IB school, my um, philosophy is still um, the International Baccalaureate and PYP. Um, so I teach through inquiry um, and I'm always encouraging students to take action if they don't, uh, you know, if they see things that they're upset about or they don't agree with to, to change things and to take agency to control, control their own lives. Um, I was also at school um, a very efficient exam passer. So if there was a exam paper put in front of me, I would pass it. I learned how to study for exams and I learned how to um, pass them very, very well. So this is an interesting topic for me um, as an educator, but also just to reflect back on my own life where, where um, I look forward to exams. Um, whereas now as a teacher, I sort of think, well, I'm not gonna set any exams because I don't think that's gonna help my uh, students. Um, I'm just going to check on my notes what else I wanted to say in my, um, yes, exactly. So the 80s British education system is where I come from. And um, I passed all of my exams until I moved into university. And then when I got to university, I realized that although I'd learned how to pass exams, I hadn't learned how to learn. Um, and so university was a very, very difficult time for me. And um, because of that, um, as an educator, I'm, I'm very wary of um, using those very conventional assessment forms. Um, also, before I was a teacher, um, I have a master's in, in disability studies, and I looked specifically at, um, at inclusive education. Um, 
and while studying inclusive education, I, I, I looked into why um, assessment is so uh, is so difficult um, if you want to feel a truly inclusive um, system. So something that I studied quite deeply was was how we can uh, how we can change the whole system of education um, from primary through to university, and then how that would impact on how people get jobs, how, how are people selected for jobs. Um, if we haven't got a nice, if you've got degree status, if you haven't got a nice series of exam passes, how do you know what job you're gonna get in the end? So I've been looking at that conflict in, in inclusive education and in, and, in, um, and in the workforce, trying to work out how best um, to gel all those things together. So this topic has really got my brain whirring um, to, to think about all those things. Um, for a little bit of focus, I've got three main uh, questions that we're going to cover today. Um, the first is, why do we use assessment at all? What is the purpose of assessment? You, I'm sure other people will look at these questions, but we'll look at them in different ways, hopefully. Um, then some of some models of assessment that, that I use, some models of um, sort of unconventional assessment. Um, and then uh, how can we make assessment enjoyable all, all around instead of something that people dread? Because uh, even uh, even when we're looking at uh, even when we're we're working in a sort of uh, inquiry model and students hear the word formative assessment, oh my god, I've got to do my formative assessment, and then they become very stressed about it. And of course, there shouldn't be anything stressful about it. It should just be a simple case of of promoting yourself and um, and, and doing your best and being proud of your work. Um, just so before. we're ready. We're ready to go deeper now and start yeah. answering these questions, Sara. Unless exactly. you want to add something. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I'm just just wanted to say just uh, just something that I didn't have on my introduction slide that is relevant, which is that I'm I'm the head teacher now at a Bush school, and I'm so I'm teaching everything. But before that, I was basically teaching a performance subject. So a lot of my experiences in assessment are teaching a performance subject. Um, and what's been really exciting over the past five weeks is how I can transfer my um, understanding of assessment, how what I've done in, as a performance teacher, can I still do that um, in maths and in literacy and in, in the other subjects? How, how can I use those unconventional methods um, and, and bring them into, into those sort of more like standard focus subjects like maths and literacy? And that's what I've been doing. So. It's yeah. a, we, we talked about this whole idea of like when you are assessing language, you are assessing yeah. math. I, I don't think it should be similar to when we are assess arts and PE and music and, and drama. And so you just you're giving us this kind of real life example on yeah. how you moved from the performing maybe art to the whole class uh, teacher. Yeah. And let's check what did you discover during the last five weeks, Sarah? Oh, absolutely. And, and it's, it's just been a, a big, a big journey. Um, so here, continuing with the sort of I did the first question of why do we assess? Why do we use assessment? Um, on the left hand side, I've got the sort of what I consider what I might have learned at school. Why, why do teachers assess um, students? And a big thing in, in England was always for the school statistics. I don't know how it is in every country, but in, in England, at some point, your know, school was on a league table. You know, so which school was was performing best, and that was done on on children's grades in exams. That was important because you want to send your child to the best school. Um, so we also assess for parents, for parents to make a decision which school to send to, but also for parents to make a decision of how well their child is doing. Should they buy them that prize at the end of the year, or should they um, tell them we've got to do more? Uh, we're going to do phonics every night. You know how how does our um how does our assessment affect that, the parents and, and what they need to do? Um, and as I um, mentioned earlier, we also assess for future em employees um, or employers, how, how are we gonna be selected? What job will we get? So the school assessment has a big impact on that. Uh, yesterday, I had my first parent teacher meetings um, at the school. And the first parent that I met with asked me how her child was doing. And I talked about some of the fantastic things that her daughter had done. And she said to me, um, what a relief it was to hear that because the last report she'd received about her daughter had said she was um, 
below, she was achieving um, two years below her age level. And this had caused the mum a lot of stress. And I, I said to the mother that we didn't have any children who were below their age level. All of our children were functioning at their own level. And we did, I, don't, I wouldn't have assessed her as, you know, she, she should be here and she should be here. It's, it's just, she is where she is and, and she's moving forwards and she's got a, a, a kind heart and a fast brain and, and you know, she'll, she'll be in the right place at the right time. And I think that those sort of assessments that we give to parents are, are really important because they can, they, can, they can cause a lot of stress on the parent. The parent can feel like they're, it's, it's their fault that they're falling behind. What can they do to make their child um, achieve more what are they doing wrong what should they be how should they be helping them when actually they're probably doing everything right and it's just that the child wasn't ready to be in school at that time or the child had other things that they were focusing on or different social emotional issues they were focusing on so I think that that when she said that to me it, was, it, it reminded me how important it is to not have my children on a scale and not have my children compared to each other um, they're just they, they are where they are um, and, and I think since COVID, that's been a really important um, statement that teachers all over the world have been talking about, you know, our, our students are where they are. They haven't lost a year's learning. They've just learned other things in that time. If you look at the education system in, in the country where we start at three or in a country where they start at six, if you look at the adults, the adults have all caught up to the same place in the end. So yeah. but that, that it was powerful when the mother said that to me yesterday. Um, yeah, Sarah, like again, um, this whole idea of uh, the expectation. So in the French system, we start teaching reading and writing at age of six. If I go to another <laughs> system, they maybe start at age of five. In Finland, they start at seven. So when we are saying like, uh, this is the expectation of the grade level, who's deciding? <laughs> and so it's better to start looking at... Ali is here, he's able to read 10 words at the beginning of the year, and now at the end of the year, he's able to read a full sentence and a full paragraph. And then if Ali was starting by reading a full paragraph, then at the end of the year, he's reading a full story. And that's yeah. how I'm checking Ali's progress during this academic year. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that was a, that was a, a phrase I learned in, in my master's, value added. That you looked at value-added education. You don't. You didn't look at what what did the, if the child starts at, starts at this level, then what did they what did they gain through the year? You didn't. You didn't worry where they got to. You worried about the difference between the beginning and the end. Um, and so then I, I thought about why do we why do I assess um, why do I assess students because I'm doing it all the time. Um, taking on a new class like I just have, I had to find out. What do these students need to learn? What do they need? What are they looking to do next? What do they want to do next? Um, and I did that through a lot of curiosity, through asking a lot of questions and sitting down with them and working out problems together in maths, or finding out what strategies they use, giving them little creative writing tasks, things that they might be inspired to do, see what they could write, what they needed help with. Um, and, and from that, I've shaped the curriculum going forwards. What, where do we have to go? And that's one reason why I would be assessing all the time, um, whether that's through asking children at the beginning, you know, what do you want to learn? What, do you, what are you wondering? What are you thinking? Um, or whether that's just through that daily little check-in to see, like, how are you solving this problem in maths? Also, also you, you know, what, how do we count in twos or how do we count in threes or whatever? Just gently and constantly changing and shaping the curriculum through that. Uh, continuous assessment. Um, also, we assess to develop our learners' accountability if they if they understand um, that the, the way that their learning is is changing um, that that um, that that they're accountable for their own work. Um, so, if we assess in those other ways, which we're going to come on to, um, where children are sort of assessing their own work, when they become accountable for their own work, they're going to um, consider. Um, what can I do differently to make myself better um, or rather than what does my teacher need to do differently to make me better um, and the other reason we assess is to check that students have really understood the work so we well, I'm not going to test uh, do a spelling test um, or a multiplication table test but I will um, give little challenges to check that the students have developed a deeper learning of, of the facts 
Um, so that's what that's why ISS. Um, is, yes. is those so these things. like six points are very interesting because also we are sharing those different perspectives on uh, uh, for whom also we are assessing. And so, um, mm -hmm. and then I'm not sure like what about the student side? I don't see them there on this list. Are they going to appear in the following <laughs> slides? Maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From now on in, only students, yes. yeah. Okay, <laughs> let's continue. Uh, this was just a, when I started looking into assessment on, online, I, I thought about this and, and I, do, I don't know, I imagine there are still uh, plenty of places in the world where assessment looks like this. But then again, um, they also have the folder, so they had their papers, and so you're yes. not allowed to look at my paper. I'm not sure if you've been in a situation like that, but uh, I remember when I used to be a child, and then in a yeah. very similar uh, environment, we had these uh -huh. folders, and then we separate uh, our tables, or we create mm -hmm. our own private space, so no one is looking at our paper. That's that's interesting, isn't it? Because not only do you wanna, you, you don't want your friends to copy what you're doing. It's so important that it's only, only you get to do it because you know you're yeah. doing it right. But but we always help. found found ways to copy from the other. You yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. And and at some point, I, I also had exams where I was allowed. You know, I had open book exams. They were Ooh. called so like chemistry yes. or something where you're allowed to research. Yeah, during yeah. the exam, of course, you had, that meant you had to have the research skills. But, but then sometimes, like we used to fail even the open book exam because we don't <laughs> yeah. know how to search for the answer. Absolutely, <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's hopefully. I mean, IB educators, that's what we're doing, isn't it? Yeah. We're just teaching how to search for the answer, yes. yeah, and and not <clears throat> remember the facts. Yeah. Mm. So, um, so as I've been talking, I've been referring to how I'm constantly sitting with my students and looking at what they're doing and having conversations about the work they're doing and watching it. And, and I haven't been doing um, any like one off assessments, like at the, at the end of the term, we're going to sit down and do some tests um, or exams or um, anything. And I'm, I'm in a very privileged position that I don't have to do that. There's no school authority telling me that I have to do that. Um, the parents are keen that the children are sort of moving through a, a national a British key stage one or two national curriculum so we're sort of moving through that in case they have to slot back into a British school but I don't have to sit down and do those tests with them I'm very lucky um, but the reasons for me for not doing that is that I know that we're not good every day some days we can just um, remember everything and, and work everything out and, and academically we're strong and other days um, we've had a bad day or we haven't slept well or yesterday we had an argument with someone or we've got tummy ache or there's a problem at home or whatever it is um, we, we won't do as well at school or we won't do as well in our life and and those one-off exams don't allow for that whereas continuous observation is our way of, of checking progress and also checking for those little ups and downs and problems that people might be having um, so just before I um, carry on chattering um, it's your turn to chat and just a si simple question when I say unconventional assessment what comes to mind you can pop your ideas quick thoughts in the chat and Ali will uh, will help us filter them out yes so for all the people watching on Facebook so you can also interact with us when I say unconventional assessment what comes to your mind and even here on zoom so feel free to put for us some keywords and again that the title of the session today at the end of this day um, is, is uh, very provoking so according to Mona it's about the student centered uh, Dalal is talking about project a flipped classroom uh, and I remember everyone if you choose in that chat to everyone so everyone will be able to see your ideas uh, problem solving Nisreen is looking for new ideas related to assessment um, not the formal traditional idea uh, I'm seeing uh, authentic assessment uh, out of the box and so it's less scary we were talking about the fear about assessment in the previous session there is no borders for the assessment nice one and then there is a new type of assessment according to Iman uh, so uh, these are some of the ideas 
when we say unconventional assessment from the people who are watching. Lujain, she added indirect assessment. So maybe it's a formal, informal. I'm reading between the lines. I'm getting more words. A student, they are more involved. We're using the technology. Hello, Rasha. Rasha is watching from Lebanon and she's a good friend. I hope you are still in Lebanon or no, I don't know. But uh, so using new strategy, hello, Maya. So I'm seeing some nice friends. Dalal is referring to the medical field. And so it's an interaction with the patient. And mm -hmm. this is a very interesting also kind of a metaphor or connection uh, and thinking in using different perspective. Uh, okay, so Russia is confirming that she's still in Lebanon. So <laughs> good, we can continue, Sarah. I think uh, we got a nice variety of answers when we said, uh, unconventional assessment and what's mm -hmm. come to the mind of the uh, of the teachers and the attendees today mm -hmm. and, and isn't it fantastic that there are so many ideas that, that yes. everyone is already thinking well what are the different otherwise why would you come to one of these conferences right you're yeah. coming to the <laughs> you're thinking about assessment in all of its different ways and how can we do things uh just trying to read that. How, how can we do things differently? When we say assessment, no one is scared, neither the I, I, I wanted to read it aloud. So yeah, no one is scared. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. Not the parent, the educator, or the learner. That's really okay, nice. Dalal is saying yeah. she teach a pharmacy student, and so we assess also drugs, and so uh, we assess medicine, and so we check also with the patient. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't have this kind of connection to assessment, so it's nice <laughs> to hear it also. Good, I have people interacting on Facebook, so let me say hello to Amani. And Amani, she said, like, unconventional assessment will make the learner feel better, and so they will assess their own learning without stress mm -hmm. very nice i think you read my notes that's that's very that's very much <laughs> amani so did you read the note of sada let's yeah. check <laughs> that's fantastic and absolutely i mean that idea of being more student-centered is what what i'm looking at today there there's plenty of different ways i saw people talk about padlets and online assessments there's many different ways we can do this but i'm looking very much at, at student um centered stuff today um, which button did I press last time? Sorry. Okay, uh, so my main focus today is peer and self-assessment. So peer assessment um, is, is assessing each other, students assessing each other's work, and self-assessment is students um, assessing their own work. Um, and I thought about what are some of those main, like, difficult questions about that. Um, who decides the rubric? That's something we'll talk about. Um, should we assess everything that we learn? Is it important? Um, should I assess the peer assessment myself? Should I be looking back at the, what they have, what they assess, and how they how they assessed it and assess their assessment? Um, and what about reports? Because we all have to, most of us have to write reports um, on how on our students' work, or at least interact with the parents, as I was saying. And um, so. The question who decides the rubric is going gonna, is gonna to be um, addressed a little more. Um, it's very, very much um, something that you work towards with the students. You don't start off um, with peer and self-assessment and say to your kids, and today you're going to write the rubric for your next piece of work, because that will leave them high and dry. You, you scaffold the work together with them. So if you're looking at, um, at assessing a, a presentation, um, then that you start off with the students by thinking about what is a good model for a presentation, what should a good presentation contain, what sort of, um, how should it be delivered, and you, you set up the expectations that the kids think would be a, a good, or the learners think would be a good um, presentation, and, and that becomes the rubric. So they, they set it, but with, with help, and depending on the age group, that might be the first few times you write a simple rubric, and they work into it and then they start to add in their own questions until they take it over all together. So it's a step-by-step -step thing. You know your learners, you know what they're capable of, and you, you never want to throw them in the deep end, but, but gradually help them um, design their own rubric. I, I definitely don't consciously assess everything that I teach, but certainly with uh, social emotional things, I'm, I'm in my head, I'm assessing all the time. Where are we at? What do we need to do next? 
Um, but I'm not asking my, well, sometimes I'm asking my students to assess that, but not so often. I don't assess the peer assessment, um, but I do check that it's being done um, fairly and kindly, which is something we'll talk about a bit more. And what about reports? Well, I would, um, I would quite happily not uh, write reports <laughs> at all, but if we need to, then I've, I'm going to be writing them with my students so that they, they input the words into them too. So we start with self-assessment. And um, for me, self-assessment is really important because um, it's something that we do all the time as, a, as humans. We can't help it. We are self-assessing all the time. We're checking ourselves. I'm checking myself all the time now, thinking, did I speak too fast? Did I speak too slow? Was I clear enough? Am I making my point? We do it all the time. And self-assessment establishes those, those self-critical um, reflection routines. And it makes it become a sort of uh, second nature thing. So we don't have to uh, we don't have to panic if someone says assess our work. We it's something that we're used to doing. Um, and whilst the the word I've used is self critical, it could also be self kind. When I start doing self assessment with students, I don't get them to look at um, things that have gone wrong in their work. I just get them to look at the things they're most proud of. There might be some concrete things you can look at, like, uh, like um, you know, did you put a finger space between your words or look back through your, your maths and, and solve those problems another way um, to, check, to check you get the same answer. But, but the whole um, purpose of it is to establish the, the self-kindness. Um, what did you do well? What are you most proud of? Um, what would you like to change if you did it again? If you were going to show this to someone else, you know, what would you? How would they feel about it? Um, so trying to keep it keep it very positive. Um, self assessment nurtures pride in your work. It makes you start to think about um, creating something that you want other people to see. Um, so as a as a performance teacher, a, a musician, um, if I'm going to perform, um, or if my students are going to perform. I want to do my, my absolute best work. I want to do something that um, respects the audience. And I think that um, in self-assessment, that's what we're doing. We're, we're learning about that pride to say, I've, I've, I've done my best work, actually. This is something that I'm quite happy to share. This is something that I've done well at. Um, and, and in turn, then that develops that internal motivation. So this is nothing about someone put a star on your work or a sticker to say, well done, or gave you a, a star or a 12 in your exams or something. Um, it's about you realizing that, that as, you, as you do your best, you get the, that feeling of pride and that feeling that you know where you're going. It's not something that you just uh, throw at your kids, as I said. It's something that you take them through in steps so the first time you do it, you keep with those soft, um, soft questions. Um, a lot of scaffolding as they're working out what will make their best work. Um, it could be just at the bottom of a, of a writing sheet. Let's say, did I put my finger spaces? Um, is this my best handwriting? Have I used punctuation? It could just be them ticking those things. Um, what's, the, what's the minimum I need to do to, to make this a good piece of work? Have I achieved that? Um, away from the sort of maths and literacy thing, if it's music or uh, drama or art, um, record your work, listen to it back. Um, how does it make you feel? Um, what could you change? As a piano teacher, I did it all the time. All the time, my students recorded themselves and listened back to their music and to hear what do they need to change to make it better. And that's all self-assessment. And that's something that's done ongoing every day, every day my students are assessing their work. Um, yeah. And what does self-assessment look like? Um, I chose this picture um, because this student um, ha has been used to being in a school where he, his teacher marks his book every day. And um, without any big discussion about it, he started to realize that I wasn't marking his book every day. Um, and so at the end of the day, he went through and he just put smiley faces on the top of the pages that he was most proud of. And, and I realized that he was just very naturally self-assessing his work and he was doing what he needed to, to keep his, uh, that motivation going. I'm proud of this and I'm proud of this, but this one probably could have done a bit better. So here's, 
am extremely proud of, um, of uh, some building work. We're looking at housing all over the world and he got very excited by building a sort of futuristic house. Um, of course, self-assessment is not always as positive as this picture. Um, and that's something that as educators, we need to be really aware of that we might have um, students that are very self-critical and we need to support them um, as we go through this process to, to pull out the positives from their work um, and, and, not, and not dwell on, on the negatives, um, to see the negatives as opportunities for change and, and not as bad things. Um, what does self-assessment look like? It could be written down, so it, it doesn't have to be, you know, with the thumbs up, thumbs down, the, the child could write their own little comment on their work. Um, and I noticed people talk about Padlets. I was using Seesaw a lot in my last school. Students would look at their work on Seesaw and then just leave a voice clip to talk about how they felt about it or a video of themselves discussing um, how they felt about their work. Here's a piece of work I've done, this is this, this is that, but talking their way through the work and, and describing it and, and assessing it that way. Um, I found they were really, really useful actually that if it's possible to use those video technologies um, that I found my students were, were very good at um, self-assessing when they were doing it to a camera. Maybe it made it feel a little bit more third person, but it was definitely useful. Mm -hmm. And then we look at, did I, I skipped a slide? Mm, there we go. Then we're going to look at peer assessment. So in, this is the sort of scaffolding questions for peer assessment. Um, what's gone? This is how we start um, assessing each other's work. So for example, um, in, instead of uh, saying to students, just, um, okay, this is, this is Ali's work. Well, how do you think he did today? Um, these, these so are some Sarah, I'm going to ask you the question. Yeah. So, because it's really connected to this. When we yeah. ask a student about his or her opinion about another student's work, is that yeah. peer assessment? So let me hear your, your example and your feedback. Yeah, no, absolutely. Peer assessment is, is exactly that. When we ask other students, what did they think about that? A, a different but student. do we keep it open like that or do we give them some tools like because here I can see that you have the starters yeah exactly and these these are so these are the tools in it was self-assessment I, I have um I've used different tools for different uh different outcomes um but with with peer assessment I've, I've often come back to this set of this set of sentences um so it's a, a, this, this is one set and th this is for slightly older students. Your first question is what went well? And then we've got some ideas of sentences. You should be very proud of this. The best part of your work is this. It would have been even, could have been even better if you did these things. And your next steps should be, when, my, when I first used peer assessment, I um, just take the what went well. And we just look at, those positives and and with some students that that can be a struggle because they really 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 want to tell their friends what they could have done better and uh so we we, we keep it very strictly within that we're just going to stick to the what went well um statements um and then as as the students are, are feeling um comfortable doing that then we start to look at next steps or it would have been even better if um statements and to keep it gentle. Um, with younger students, I sometimes use the, the sort of two stars and a wish um, model or three stars and a wish. So two things that that person that, that were really, really good at that, that piece of work. Um, and you know, one thing that, that they could have done better. If we're talking about um, you know, maths, um, then, and I'm not using those um, sentence starters, um, when we, when we look at maths, I've been mostly using self-assessment, so the students going back and, um, and working on the problems in different ways to check that they always get the same answers. The reason that's happening for me at the moment is because I have the, all of my learners are at a completely different level in maths, so it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be easy to, um, for them to share that. So the reasons I use peer assessment in the classroom, one of them is that it 
creates a really good sense of community. Their students are sharing their work, they're talking about it, um, they're reflecting on it, they're thinking about the different things they could do differently um, as you assess someone else's work. Then you think about how your own work could be different. Um, you, you're working on those little steps to, to tweak things to make them to make them better or, or more exciting or, or more thorough, more in depth. So that community is growing as, as kids are sharing ideas and thinking about um, the, diff the different ways uh, they can do things. Um, it, at the same time, then we're, we're growing that group empathy. So students are um, recognizing where their friends' strength and knowledge is, um, where their peers' strength and knowledge is, and, their, and also where their friends need more help. Um, and where they need more help. So we're getting that constant feeling that we're all in a different place. We all have different things that we know and things that we don't know. And we're sort of moving together to, to grow, that, grow that empathy as a group. Excuse me. And then it also is um, developing your ability to reflect um, and imagine how things could be different. Um, so as you're assessing your, your friend's work, your you're imagining, well, I could do that differently. If, if I was gonna do that piece of work again, this is what I would do differently, as well as this is what I would, I think my friends could do differently. Um, so examples of peer assessment um, I have that I've used regularly are from performing arts, um, which, so for example, um, I did a lot of drama work with students um, making up their own dramas to to talk about different concepts that they were learning about um, in, in other subjects. So, for example, um, learning about um, opposites and uh, we, we, we were looking at opposites and we looked at the difference between um, poor and rich and homeless and housed. And we did that through a sort of drama, a drama piece that they wrote themselves. Um, each piece was recorded and videoed. And then the next lesson, we shared each video on the on the big screen, and the students made notes of what they thought about the about their work. Um, and those sorts of things are, are very natural peer assessments. What were very noticeable when we um, when we assess that way is that the students are completely engaged because they they really want to see how how their friend's piece of work turned out. So you get this full every child's eyes are on the screen watching the, their friends perform and then taking notes and concentrating and, and every student would want to participate and comment on each other's work. When you do that kind of thing with self-assessment, some students are very reluctant to comment on their own work, but when you do it with peer assessment, you can, you can really feel that, that they, uh, they really want to share like praise and uh, you know, gratitude, but also like, hey, let's do that again. Let's try and do it this way or that way. What about if you, if you depicted houses differently or you depicted uh, groups differently? So that you, you constantly get this uh, engagement, which is which is really fun to see. And um, when when you show kids videos of each of themselves performing and get them to uh, assess it. So here we, we look at um, what does peer assessment sound like? And, um, and very much for me, peer assessment often is the sound of children giggling because they're watching each other on the screen and it is so exciting and, and so ridiculous to see your friends on the TV screen um, that, that it creates a lot, of, a lot of happiness and giggling. Um, and it's very supportive um, because as, as you do this process with your students over a long period of time, you realize that they really want each other to succeed. That group empathy is growing and growing and the feeling that we want to get better as a team as that classroom community is, is growing. So that support of them giving giving advice, but giving advice, say this was, this was so much better than the last thing that you did because like, you remember last time, you know, you were, you were, stumbling with your words or you were feeling shy or you didn't uh, but this time you know you'd really worked on that and it was clear and it was well presented and the point got across students were very good at, at um, keeping that sort of 
continuous reflection going through all of their uh, all of their exercises in um in maths and, and literacy it's very much also very supportive i found students to be very kind to each other they just want they want to help they want to support their friends to move on and sometimes the hardest thing is is just to stop them from doing their friends work redoing it for them oh you made a mistake i'll do it for you and getting them to say hang on a minute that that's not that's really kind but that's not going to help long term we need to think how can we you know help each other to to do this better what helped you learn how to do this and reflecting back so so peer assessment is always um very supportive um, involves a lot of giggling and, and generally happiness because they're enjoying um, assessing each other's work, um, but it's also um, the most engaged I find my students is when they're assessing each other's work. And then beyond that, do we have any other questions about self and peer assessment? Because I'm going to go off on a slight tangent. I think we can continue, Sarah. We still have approximately 10 minutes, so... Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So beyond that, I thought about other other tools that we've got that we use for assessment or that I use for assessment. And, uh, and this would be one of my uh, one of my favorite ones here. Um, so when we start a new topic in, in, um, in a IB school, anyway, a lot of teachers use this uh, routine. See, think, wonder. This is what we're going to be studying. What do you what do you see? What does it make you think? What does it make you wonder? And um, this is something that children are very, therefore very sort of used to using. They're familiar with it. And I was thinking how we can turn that and into a, a tool for um, assessment. So finding out what does the what is the child? If you look at your work, what do you see? What do you think? What do you, does it make you wonder? That can be quite difficult for kids, especially young kids, because they well, like they did that work themselves and that they know what it made them think. But it's a very useful tool for assessing each other. We use it first as peer assessment, and then when they're used to using it for peer assessment, we can turn it back um, and use it on their own work. Um, so you look at look at your work and and the what does it make you wonder is one of the most important parts for me because it's like what's what's missing what what else can we what new things can we learn going forwards from this so we've done our assessment what what did that piece of work make you wonder about and that's like that's where we're shaping our curriculum and moving forward what does it make you think about that's where where we find out what's the content in there but wonder is like where are we going to go next um so i've been using that um that routine um, personally as an assessment tool and then also as a, as a peer assessment tool just to keep looking at those things where are we going next um, what information is in your work um, what what have you told me about what what am I thinking about doing next yeah so these are my um the benefits why why I think that unconventional um, assessments are a good idea and these things have been cropping up these ideas. The first is agency and self-reliance. So as students get used to um, assessing their own work and assessing their peers' work, then their um, dependence on, on you to tell them that they've done well or on you to tell them what they need to change is getting smaller. Um, and they're starting to realize how they can look at their work and, and move on and change it, um, do things differently. Um, uh, it also develops that sense of community. We're all working together on this project. Um, it could be, it's exciting to work together. Um, we know where we're at. As I said, that empathy is building all the time. Some of my friends have problems doing this, other friends don't, but we all have strengths and we all have things that we're great at and things that we need help with. And, and recognizing that and, and developing empathy is a really strong way of building the classroom community. Um, and it encourages action. Students start to um, support each other more. Um, they start to find new ways to, to change things um, around the classroom, around the work that they're doing. Um, <clears throat> and, and, around, yeah, and around that sort of self-care thing. How are they doing for themselves? Is there anything that they're falling 
back on that they need to 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 do to do differently so it, those three things are, are really for me really important parts of especially the primary school education because it's just like getting getting your kids into a, a community like uh, the school becomes the village and the family we're all together every day I'm, I mean especially in a school like mine where I'm the only teacher and I've got 12 kids you know that's it we're all together every day we've got to get on really well and uh, and developing community all the time is what we're doing um they're, they're the most important skills that we can uh, we can garner, I think. You are also um, in an unconventional school, Sarah. <laughs> if that's true, and, and you know, I'm and in an unconventional place. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. That's uh, I mean, even in even in Portland, I was very lucky enough to be in an unconventional school in Portland. Yes. Um, so I think I've I've done I've been very fortunate. I have an unconventional route into education because I my degree is in psychology. Um, rather than education, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a conventional personality. That's yeah. true. That's, <laughs> I'm an unconventional person. But I think, with that said, these um, these techniques work in conventional schools. True. That's true. the important thing. And that's why and, we're we're spreading them and we're sharing them today. Yeah, absolutely. Because it, even if you have those pressures of a of a school authority telling you getting telling you which exams the students have to take each at the end of each year you still got the rest of the year where you're building all these skills with your kids and, and skills to assess themselves just means that when they sit down to do an exam the stress will be taken away because they know about assessments they know how that feels because they've assessed themselves they can look at their work and say this is my best work I'm quite sure of that because they're used to doing that mm hmm and as Ali predicted, I am slightly under time. <laughs> However, um, what I thought would be would be really useful for me um, is if you could just spend a, a minute in the chat writing a, a sentence, a peer um, assessment of me. How did how did I do, um, or what did my uh, presentation make you make you think and wonder about? Good. So some feedback to Sarah so mm -hmm. she can take it further and improve. Okay. Uh, let's say if she's going to uh, prepare another webinar for you and why mm -hmm. you are putting this feedback. So we tried to model today plenty of mm -hmm. strategies, plenty of perspective, plenty of tools. I would like to remind everyone uh, by sharing my screen that we have uh, the YouTube channel. On the YouTube channel, we have more than 100 webinars now, all grouped in a very nice playlist, depending on what would you like to check. All the people who ask about the early years, we have a full uh, set of webinars for early years educators, so you can check them. They are all like ideas discussed, that they are still valid. The math teachers, we have also some webinars for math, and I will let you explore everything else. So for today, the webinars of today, they are already published. And then once we are done with Sarah, Sarah's session will be also available. On our website, this is again a final kind of a reminder. We have our November events, the paid one, they are published. We have some event in Arabic. We already published some asynchronous workshop in French, Arabic, and English on our website. And we have a monthly meeting to plan approaches to learning or uh, Les savoir-faire transdisciplinaires, so uh, les rendez-vous ADA. Uh, so you can also join uh, me and join Bianca uh, on the 23rd of November. We will be talking about uh, the ATL, and our objective will be about uh, how to plan to teach reflection. I'm sure everyone would be interested in that. And the whole uh, free webinar uh, in November will be about the 21st century skills. Uh, and so we will have different speakers in Arabic and in English. And so these speakers are going to share with you uh, their experience uh, from different location, from different schools, and hopefully you will be enjoying also the day. Sarah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for all the people who joined since 9 a.m. in the morning. And so we are getting these mm -hmm. messages in the chat, Sarah. You can see them. Mm -hmm. So um, 